Good evening, everybody. Can you all hear? I'm really delighted to welcome you to this exciting event entitled War, Peace, and Everything in Between. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the Bidigal peoples that are the traditional custodians of this land and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. Most of you don't know who I am. Um, my name is Sarah Cook, and this is my second day at UNSW as the new director of the Institute of Global Development. So what better way to... Um, <laughs> Thank you. What better way to start in this role than to have such an exciting and extraordinary uh, group of speakers um, here with us tonight. Let me first say that, that the university, UNSW, has laid out a vision and a strategy to have global impact and social engagement. And as a key part of this, the Institute of Global Development aspires to be a catalyst for all the work across the UNSW community on global issues, to work in partnership, in partnership with many of you um, from ACFID, from the development community, um, in order to achieve our common goals to transform lives and advance a just society and to achieve our global goals. I'm here really now to introduce briefly the speakers um, for this event. Um, we're, we're here to talk about some of the major challenges of our time. I think we all realize we live in a period where global conflicts in many parts of the world are escalating, but where there are also many transitions um, to more peaceful societies, but where also we have a lot of low level and new forms of conflicts, conflicts driven by poverty and inequality. We have issues around migration and population mobility. We have tensions over scarce natural resources. There are many ways in which we see um, the issues of, of peace, security, insecurity of people's lives leading to problems that need exceptional leadership skills, exceptional um, strategies for mediating, for peace building, for maintaining peace, and hopefully for preventing um, the escalations of, of conflicts and tensions. So we have here with us two extraordinary people who are going to um, share their experiences across this area of peace building, negotiation, leadership. Um, the first is His Excellency Professor Jose Ramos Horta. So, welcome. Um, again, I think His Excellency needs no introduction in this kind of forum and in this region. But as you know, he is an extraordinary diplomat. He's one of the fathers of the modern nation state of Timor Leste. Um, he's a Nobel Prize winner. Um, he's also been involved in many UN processes, including um, the Secretary General's High Level Panel on Mediation and a High Level Independent Panel on Peacekeeping Operations. And I know that he will be drawing on a lifetime of experience as a human rights advocate, as a diplomat, as a leader, as a nation builder in talking to us um, this evening. And we're also proud that he's the founder and patron of the diplomatic training program here at UNSW. Our second speaker is Professor Funmi Olonishakin, um, who is the Vice President and Vice Principal International and Professor of Security, Leadership and Development at King's College London. Um, Professor Olonishakin um, has also been a founding director of an Africa Leadership Center, um, which is really geared towards training young leaders um, in these critical skills that can help to both create peace, prevent conflict, um, and have uh, you know, stronger um, leadership in today's world. Um, she's also been a key member of many UN um, processes and panels, including an advisory group of experts on youth peace and security, an implementation panel on peace operations, and a UN advisory group of experts on the review of the peace building architecture. So I think you can see we have extraordinary experience here in the room to try and address and consider with us some of the issues and challenges around war, peace, and everything in between. And to facilitate this conversation, I'm also really honored to, to meet and welcome 
um, Hamish MacDonald. Um, I think probably most of you are more familiar with Hamish as a journalist, a television pre presenter of current affairs programs um, in this part of the world. Um, but I've just having looked through his, his biography and seen all the different places and conflict situations that he's reported from, I think we couldn't have somebody better qualified to lead this discussion. So over to you. Welcome everybody. Um, welcome all the participants and we look forward to a really exciting conversation and learning from you tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Sarah Cook. Pretty good for your second day on the job, I reckon. Well done. <laughs> um, and thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon. We know it's late in the day and you've, you've uh, had a few conversations already. I hope we'll live up to uh, the record that's been set already. Uh, I should start probably uh, just by sharing with you a short anecdote about the first time I met Jose Ramasorta. And I think it was in uh, Dili in 2006. I was working for Al Jazeera and we sat down and did this lovely interview at his house where he told us, well, I'm going to run for the presidency. And I rang the news desk afterwards and said, oh, this guy's going to run for the presidency. The you know, Nobel Peace Prize winner. We were, at that time, experimenting with some new technology, some BGAN technology, which meant we could send material straight away from anywhere in the world. I said, get it in, we'll put it on, and it went straight to where within a few hours. It was the main story on Al Jazeera. Within another hour, it was the top story on CNN and the BBC. And suddenly, we had a very quick representation from one of your advisors. It's like, what are you doing? We didn't think this was going to go to air for weeks. We haven't announced it yet. <laughs> we said, well, you have. Yeah. Uh, so I tell that story to remind all of you that this is all on the record. It is being filmed. <laughs> People have their phones so they can tweet as well. Uh, it's a great honour to participate in this conversation this afternoon uh, with two obvious global leaders in this area uh, at a time that I think we can all probably agree is pretty fascinating if not challenging as well. I want to start with a, a question about this title, War, Peace, and Everything in Between. To me, covering conflicts today, it's the in-between that's the really interesting bit. So many of the conflicts that I get asked to go and cover are somewhere in between. They're not necessarily open conflict, hot conflict. They're definitely not post-conflict. They're somewhere in the middle of that. And I wonder, for me, if you could offer us an observation on the particular challenge that is posed by that when it comes to human rights and upholding international norms and international law, where it's not clear mm. what defines the unruliness that's unfolding. No, absolutely. I think talking about the in-betweens is fascinating for this kind of conversation because those are the silent areas we never say anything about. If you take the continent of Africa, for example, they're probably what? Depending on what you're counting, seven or eight uh, peace operations. Um, President uh, Ramos Hota has been special representative in one uh, in Guinea-Bissau. You count all of that on your fingertips, and then you wonder, does that mean that every other place is stable, peaceful, but no, take the Sahel. If you count Mali where there's an operation, in much of the Sahel there isn't stability and we don't talk about it, but there's business as usual where you find multinationals you know, continuing to operate. You find the big powers, the medium powers, the small ones operating across all of those corridors uh, between northeastern Nigeria, southern Algeria. You find all of that migration going on. So there's good business, good business being conducted. And yet, we don't talk about the kinds of injustices, uh, the human rights abuses, what goes on even along those corridors where migrants uh, you know, move up and down. And this actually is the big elephant in the room as far as I'm concerned. Jose, do you have an observation on that? Is it a particularly unique challenge that we face today because there is so much, so many of these scenarios where it's not necessarily open warfare, it's not post-conflict, 
but there's migrants being driven out, there are large-scale human rights abuses, there are populations being displaced wholly. Uh, be, uh, before uh, I answer your question, allow me 30 seconds <laughs> to uh, acknowledge the presence here of the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps in Canberra, the Timor-Leste Ambassador uh, to Australia, Abel Guterres. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, a, a, a great uh, diplomat, a great human being. Uh, he, our uh, foreign ministry, uh, even though we are a small country, new, very strict with the amount of time, length of time an ambassador can stay in a country. Usually never more than three years. He has been in Australia seven years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because uh, uh, our uh, government, the president, rely a lot on him and trust him and so on. And he knows everyone in Australia, particularly civil society. The other one, a young, younger diplomat, uh, George uh, Santos of, of our consulate general office in uh, Sydney. And uh, uh, Kamal, uh, uh, Kamal Fadel, uh, representative of the people of Western Sahara. And, uh, uh, I don't know how many of you in this room would know about Western Sahara. Oh. Uh, a bit like, could be a bit like East Timor when I first went to New York and I would tell uh, my favorite uh, uh, little Chinese restaurant uh, waiter in New York because I would always go to these cheaper places as I'm from East Timor. He would say, oh, you're an Eskimo. <laughs> uh, and go, so, so I, I hope that you know more about Western Sahara than you uh, uh, people in New York knew about East Timor. So having said that, uh, uh, no, what is uh, really uh, uh, extraordinary about these times, 21st century, of uh, instant global communication, interdependency of uh, countries and interests, that some of the conflicts go on uh, with the major powers that be because of their interests, because of their dependency on a particular country, they allow on they don't say much at all. I talk about the war in Yemen. Who? Uh, the European Union uh, imposed sanctions on Myanmar uh, because of the problem in Rakhine State. They don't say a word about uh, the war in Yemen. Far, far greater scale. The Human Rights Council in Geneva absolutely active and rightly so on Rakhine State. They hardly say a word about Yemen. Why? Because Saudi Arabia is fun funding a good part of uh, uh, the Human Rights Council activities. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia even mentioned, managed to get elected into the Human Rights Council. When uh, this first happened six months ago, a year ago, I put something in my page, uh, Facebook, and I said, well, next, the UN is going to elect Imelda Marcos, you're familiar with Imelda Marcos, as chair of a UN commission on corruption in the shoe industry. <laughs> <laughs> so my point is to say there are certain limits to pragmatism, to real politic. If we all, if the European Union, the US, and others, even the Conference of Islamic States, can engage uh, in uh, such uh, blatant uh, double standard, well, then we all 
undermining completely the multilateral system. system. So who is going to take seriously? So, so if the multilateral system is failing on a question like Yemen, whose job is it to drive resolution? Yeah. You know, uh, uh, the, the challenge, the problem in Yemen will come to an end. But you know, uh, allow me. A few years ago, maybe six, five years ago, I and Marty Atisari, former president of Finland, we both were guest speakers at the UN in Geneva, at the Palais des Nations. And uh, <coughs> most questions actually were addressed uh, to me. Uh, and that was at the UN. There was like 700 people there. And of course, you were competing with Marty Atisari from attention. Uh, uh, is uh, not difficult. <laughs> in, <laughs> in Marty, I'm sorry, great statesman, diplomat, but being Finnish is extremely low-key, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, he was extra cautious in answering questions. Unlike me, you know, so I, uh, I was asked a question about Syria. And uh, I tell people, sorry, I'm not going to give you a politically correct answer. I'm going to tell you what I feel. That was five or six years ago. I said, the war in Syria will go on for many, many years. Many tens of thousands more people will die. Let's not pretend that uh, there is going to be a solution. All we have to do is to uh, in increase, expand our efforts to look after the refugees, uh, the victims. Uh, there are too many parties involved. More than 100 factions within Syria, neighbors who are all involved one way or another, then beyond neighbors, uh, from US to France to uh, uh, UK and uh, so on, and then Russia, which was humiliated in Libya. I don't know if you're familiar with what happened in the background of to uh, Syria, when Russia and China made a mistake in allowing a resolution on the concept, the principle of protection, uh, responsibility to protect, meaning civilians. Because there were stories about uh, eminent bombing of uh, Benghazi. So a resolution was passed to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe in Benghazi. It turned out to be regime change. And then missiles fired on Gaddafi convoy killed Gaddafi. Well, Russia and China were not going to do the same mistake with uh, uh, Syria. They wouldn't allow Russia was, would not allow uh, another uh, debacle of its, its policies in Syria. So you have this uh, uh, situation. And then you have the UN, absolutely powerless, almost uh, irrelevant, because when you see the conversations on Syria, who is uh, involved? Uh, is, who are the actors? US, Russia, Turkey, Iran, and uh, sometimes President Macron of France managed to, uh, like a few days ago, they, uh, uh, <clears throat> so we, what, what I'm, uh, no easy solution, I'm not, uh, you know, saying, mm. uh, parallel, a parallel situation, the Iraq-Iran war in the 80s, you know, Saddam Hussein, sensing weakness in Iraq, uh, in Iran, uh, following the Ayatollah Khomeini revolution, etc., etc., he decided to invade. And of course, the US and others gave tacit agreement, approval to uh, Iraq to invade Iran. Well, the war went on for eight years. More than eight million people were killed, one million people killed. Chemical, biological weapons were used by Saddam Hussein on uh, Iranians, on Kurdish in, uh, in the north. 
but Iran, Iraq war, easier to resolve than Syria. Why? You have two organized states, two functioning states. When Saddam Hussein defeated, militarily defeated in Iran, ordered uh, the end of hostilities, how many ordered the end of hostilities? They ended. Mm. Because these are two organized states. The Syrian state collapsed. So who is the, making decisions? So for me, yeah. as, a, as someone that is a proponent of solutions or resolutions being found within communities, mm. is there a function for the domestic populations in a conflict like Yemen or Syria right now to bring about some kind of re resolution, or are they not really relevant to the picture given what we've just heard described? No, because Yemen and Syria, in a sense, are not in that middle state anymore that you talk about, uh, it's more difficult. Th those are examples of a multilateral system that is no longer fit for purpose. Why? Because the guardians of that system have, in a sense, abdicated their responsibilities. Through you say the they, but do you mean the U.S.? Oh, I mean the, the permanent members of the Security Council, in a sense. The U.S. Uh, in some instances, Russia in other in instances. So you can look at Syria, Ukraine, uh, Yemen. You can look across the board and see how they have been complicit. Uh, and so this is the crux of it. In, in Yemen and Syria, we're not going to find any kind of solution at the, at the local level because the nature of the coercive power that's been brought to bear is not one that locals can cope with easily, except to be resilient in their different uh, ways and just try to deal with existential threats under those circumstances. But now, let's, let's get to the crux of the matter in places that are the middle point, that are you know, at the intersection that you talk about. The crux of that matter is local populations are fighting two kinds of battles. Battles with their own uh, local elite, with their governing elite, and battles with the international system. Because what you see is a situation in which, because of the very nature of the interest of the international actors, they have aligned with corrupt, inept, uh, and if you like, unjust uh, local leaders against the interests of the people. What you're likely to find ultimately in the 21st century will be the kinds of protests or the kinds of, uh, the combination of anti-state activities by populations who need to survive in spite of their leaders and in spite of, uh, you know, a less elegant and less well-meaning international community that hides behind uh, old archaic principles of statehood uh, to more or less molest and prey upon those populations. I don't want to entirely depress everyone here, yeah. but I, I think it's worth noting that you've just described the international system as being no longer fit for purpose, and you've talked about local populations having a battle themselves with the international system. Do you think the international system itself is driving these conflicts, is creating them? I mean, you cannot talk about the international system without the powers that underpin that international system. If you're looking at the United Nations, you're essentially talking about five permanent members of the Security Council without whose interest, without whom uh, you cannot make any meaningful change happen. Then you cannot be talking about that multilateral system without talking about powerful, uh, if you like, multi national arrangements as well, business arrangements or financial system that reinforce all the very things we're talking about. So, so for whom uh, was this system created if the bulk, you know, if the vast majority of the, uh, of the population of the world is having to exist in spite of the system? So do, do you agree with President Donald Trump that that system's broken? But would you not also argue that his leadership and his form, his approach, is part of the reason why that system is being broken. But let's be honest, it dates back well beyond Trump, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But when you have a U.S. that pulls back uh, from, a, from a common approach to the, to the international system, we said the same thing during the Iraq war. I remember in New York uh, on the eve of the bombing, March 20th, uh, 2003, how 
how calamitous that was and how we sat in New York and just thought things, you know, the world had changed completely because the most powerful nation in the world had pulled out of uh, a collective multilateral system and decided to, to take unilateral action in Iraq. Now you find the you find a reinforcement of that in different ways in the Trump administration that is so nationalistic in its focus and does not think uh, about a U.S. that needs to bear responsibility uh, for delivering the good in the world mm. and that interprets that good uh, on any given day on the basis of how the leader feels. But that in itself is part of why the, the multilateral system that could be repaired is lose, losing credibility. And the fact that that multilateral system does not have any other part uh, of, of the system that is able to check uh, that kind of dominance that is working in the negative. That actually is the crux of the matter. Jose, notwithstanding the many challenges that still confront East Timor, coming from that country, wouldn't you say that there are still some pretty strong examples of how the international system does function and does produce yeah. good and does lead to strong democratic outcomes for populations that, that need and want that? Not only uh, uh, Timor-Leste, but uh, I could also cite the example of Namibia, uh, transition to independence at the end of uh, the apartheid uh, era. Uh, and uh, Namibia was always on the UN agenda in New York. There was even a body called the Council for Namibia. Uh, and there are other instances in the past where the UN uh, played important role, like for instance, in the six, uh, mid 60s on, uh, the UN Special Committee on Decolonization mm -hmm. of the General Assembly was incredibly active uh, in Africa in particular. Can, can, can you think of more recent examples? Uh, but uh, then, <laughs> um, uh, in relation to Timor-Leste, many factors contributed to the final uh, outcome. The end of the Cold War, uh, then more immediate, uh, 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 more recent financial economic crisis in Indonesia, the fall of Suharto regime, uh, an incredible international solidarity movement on uh, about Timor Leste, et cetera, et cetera, all of that. Uh, but uh, the main actors were always and are always the people on the ground. If the Timorese people had given up fighting, no amount of international sympathy would have so. People went on fighting and dying, hoping, having illusions, maybe next year, maybe next year, and goes on mm -hmm. and on. So, uh, You're talking in, about hope. Yes, yes, hope. So. Uh, but then, uh, uh, I would say, yes, the Security Council in 99 uh, acted in uh, the most expeditious and fastest manner when violence happened following the announcement of the result of the referendum organized by the UN. With a matter of days, the Security Council uh, 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 made a decision to authorize an international force into Timor-Leste. Yeah. But that was, the, one day a book has to be written about the diplomatic negotiation that took place behind the scenes. Because Indonesia had to agree to it the Security Council would not have it deploy, uh, authorize a force to Timor-Leste if Indonesia said no and no and no. It wouldn't, uh, so on the Indonesian side, there were changes in Indonesia and uh, the new uh, transition leadership under B.J. Habibi, later uh, uh, Guzdur, uh, Abdul Rahman Wahid, they decide time to change. It mm. was wrong what uh, is happening in Timor-Leste. So the UN was critical as well as Australia and other partner, parties to engage with the inter, uh, international uh, security force. Mm. But also they are very important, Australia and many other countries, Japan and uh, our neighbors, Singapore, mm. uh, Europeans, 
during that critical period where the conflict had just ended, but the situation was still completely undefined, and un uh, unstable. So during the first brief period, immediately after the conflict, yes, the role of the international community is very important. Okay, However, so. passing that, or in parallel to that, local actors, local leaders had to take over yeah. and have to be wise. So it was the Timorese uh, leaders who then pacified the situation, avoided a civil war. How, for, like Sudan, we didn't have a civil war after the end of Indonesian occupation. Why? We pursue a policy of national reconciliation and we pursue a policy of reconciliation with Indonesia. And Indonesia responded positively also. So we work on two tracks. One, national reconciliation. The other one, reconciliation with Indonesia. And that led by a charismatic authority, and that's Shanani Guzman. He was a fighter in the mountains. He was a prisoner. And using that moral authority, he told our people, we must forgive. We must move on. So bridge with because there are many Timorese who collaborate with the other side. It's, it was not like black and white that the Indonesians were only bad and Timorese are all good. <laughs> so you had to heal the wounds among the Timorese and have the courage to tell the people, we must reach out to Indonesia. Because remember, some in the international community were telling us, even criticizing us for not calling for an international tribunal on Indonesia. We said no we rejected an international tribunal because we said Indonesia itself is in transition from dictatorship to democracy, very fragile. We cannot exacerbate the changes in, uh, uh, tensions in Indonesia with this humiliating uh, uh, international tribunal on Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So the Indonesian side appreciated they were even surprised that the Timorese leaders, supposedly radicals, after all, understood very well Indonesia, better than many in the international community. That's why today, Timorese and Indonesia have excellent relationship. No two countries in Asia have a better relationship than Indonesia and Timor-Leste. Hey, Mr. President, you were able to go that far. I want to argue because also you didn't have uh, natural resources that everybody was clamoring after. Uh, had you had a significant you know, deposit of mineral resources and all of those things, you may not have been able to get uh, the international or the external world and external interests out of uh, Timor. But, but I, 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 think, I, I think that when you look at the success of, of Timor, uh, there were valuable internal dimensions to this. Like you said, you had local leadership uh, and local leaders that were aligning towards, you know, themselves towards a common goal. Therefore, if you look at what we did on the um, UN advisory uh, group of experts for the review of the peace building architecture, we were given, you recall, five case studies in, on our panel, Timor, Sierra Leone, Burundi, Central African Republic, South Sudan. These are more recent examples, and only Timor is the success case uh, in all of this. That's, that tells us something significant. Look at South Sudan uh, ended up being a disaster because we used a model where we insisted on a particular model that we use for every other peace operation. Uh, uh, scholars will say it's a liberal peace agenda, whatever it is that we call it. The idea that we have to build a particular kind of democratic state. Even when it's obvious that what we have done is aligned the entire uh, international community behind two leaders, mm. not the whole of society. And so we produced uh, an elite system that could not really uh, uh, you know, promote a common destiny for the people of South Sudan. Is it useful though, in your view, to look at models that have been successful and try and transfer them? Or is each situation, the dynamics so unique that you can't really apply a like-for-like like model? 
by the way, I, I don't think a like-for-like -like model works in that way. In that period, you can say that there have been, you know, many successes, mm. uh, partly because the jury is just out, it's still out. Liberia, we've only in the last year withdrawn uh, UN uh, forces from Liberia. Sierra Leone has had successive changes in government. And at the same time, this is what we try to do in South Sudan with mm. a different story. When we could have reversed the order for South Sudan by aligning the, uh, what do you call it, the values mm. that we're talking about around the people of South Sudan and not around leaders. We shouldn't, why should we have elections and also you know, have a referendum and have elections mm. when we could have had several referenda I, in I, South Sudan? I, I'm conscious that we are running yeah. out of time. Uh, I do want to offer, I suppose, something constructive and hopeful yeah. for everyone here today. Uh, and I suppose I just want to come back to this idea of constructive solutions or, or pathways to resolution. Uh, I mean, it strikes me in almost every kind of conflict I go to cover, there'll almost always be some suggestion that you need to apply the sort of Balkan solution or yeah, yeah. some example from the past. You know, we need to get Richard Holbrook here to Afghanistan so that he can do what he did in, in Bosnia. I mean, is there, do you think, some utility in looking at what is a pretty, you know, long list of case studies now and applying them to some of the conflicts and human rights challenges that we have in front of us now? Or, or shall we say, instead of case studies or models, rather, because there's nothing in learning, I mean, there's nothing wrong with learning lessons from case studies. Case studies will provide uh, positive lessons as well as negative lessons. And we then have to interrogate the environment where we're going to intervene to ask what is suited, what is best suited to them. Instead of already determining that this is a model that we, we will use. Why don't we look for the solutions within those particular societies and help those societies move towards the solutions that work for them? But what it means, therefore, uh, will be that we should have an international system that is flexible enough to accept that an ideological marriage to the idea of a liberal program that has to look exactly like what we want it to be uh, is not what we should start with. Rather, we have to do uh, justice to the people of that environment by seeing what their own common aspirations are, uh, how they think that they can live, they want to live a successful life, even if it doesn't look like what we want but that's them a, that's to look like. That's a huge like. adjustment to ask, isn't Absolutely. it, from an international system that expects these transitions to move towards something that looks like democracy. You know, you start to get very difficult questions for the big global powers if it looks like they're installing some kind of authoritarian arrangement. But they ultimately install authoritarian arrangements, sure. even through they the so-called so uh, right? uh, so democratic approaches. And is it not democratic enough if you have a participative system in which that local society decides what is good for it and you protect the space for them to have a conversation around what is good for them? Protecting that space is not the same as saying, these are the leaders and the kinds of leaders that we want to install. I've sat in uh, closed door meetings uh, sometimes uh, at the UN at the time when I worked there, albeit uh, in, in a junior to middle position. So you're sitting in a task force meeting and people are asking you, who are the good guys? Uh, or sometimes they'll say, oh yes, um, very good guy. He was with us in UNDP or we went to Oxford or, or he went to this other place. No matter how good that guy is, he may not have the solution to what that the society where we're going to intervene des you know, deserves, what they actually want. And that's the crux of the matter because we want people who look like us, think like us, and by so doing, we exclude entire societies from participating in, in, you know, in, in their own collective destiny in that process. And unless, <laughs> yeah, thank you. Unless, we begin to do things differently, we will inadvertently kill the multilateral order that was meant to do so much good. I believe, I continue to believe in the ideals of the United Nations, but what we do as UN people on the ground and what we implement is very different from the sort of ideals that we all believe in and want to promote. And that's what needs to change.
So we're going to take some of the questions okay. from the right. audience now. I've been given this sparkly device, which is not my phone cover, is it I promise you. Yeah. Uh, so it is working. Um, if you are submitting questions, would you mind just putting your name? Uh, there's a lot of anonymous ones, which I'm not a huge fan of <laughs> anonymous questions. Um, so if you, if you want to enter some questions, please just put your name and preferably where you're from as well. But to the matter that we've just been discussing, yeah. there is quite an interesting question from anonymous. Um, authoritarian governments can make decisions efficiently. Mm. In what ways can authoritarian governments work to reduce conflicts where democracy and diplomacy fail? Yeah, you know, authoritarian governments, uh, it depends on the origin of that authoritarian government. And there are not many of them around. If you have that authoritarian government because there was a system locally that produced it, I cannot even think, maybe, would you say Morocco is authoritarian? Uh, monarchy is authoritarian in that sense. <laughs> or, uh, we're I don't talking think that likes to be called authoritarian. Uh, exactly. Uh, so, so my point is, unless that so-called authoritarian regime has started a process of uh, building that kind of collective pursuit of a national vision with the people mm. of the country, then it c it's just as bad. Could I give you an example then? Yes, yes, please do. What if we're talking about Afghanistan and we're talking about some kind of future government that is led by the Taliban? Now, the big question, is because what we call authoritarian sometimes, and this is why we might say that this, this is controversial to talk about the idea that we're allowing societies uh, to think and decide for themselves what kind of future that they want. Mm. Because sometimes that kind of future to us looks like an authoritarian regime. Mm. But if- But are we really gonna quibble about whether the Taliban leads an authoritarian regime? I, I don't know I, I, whether we should be quibbling about that. The equivalent of it is Islamic courts in Somalia. Mm. Uh, re remember is Islamic courts union? Uh, where in the end, because we insisted, we didn't want anything that looked like an Islamic courts union, even though it seemed to be building some kind of mutuality with the people on the ground. Mm. What we got in the end, when we asked Ethiopia to intervene in, in Somalia, was our Shabab. Mm -hmm. so, so we really, really need to think and ask the questions. And I think sure. there are principles we need to take to the environment. But to that you specific could, question though, yes. could the Taliban play a function in reducing the conflict? If the society responds in large numbers, you understand what, if the mm. vast majority, a broad cross section of a society responds to Taliban mm. in a particular way that they build mutuality with Taliban, we might mm. have a problem uh, internationally on our mm. hands. But if you're an ethnic but Hazara, that society, yeah. if you're an ethnic Hazara in Bamiyan, that's pretty hard to foresee how that could So it means that the broad you. cross section of the society has not accepted that. So you see, the, the principles I'm talking about is we need to ask, to what extent does what exists or what we're proposing build you know, mutually linked interests amongst the people and their leaders? Mm. And how broad is that? If it's broad-based, then we're sailing home. If it isn't broad-based, there's still a conflict to be resolved. Who resolves that conflict and how we resolve it is a different issue. All I'm arguing for is a framework and a set of questions that allow us to move that society towards what works for them. The moment we're not doing that, we're simply imposing our own values and our own ways uh, of life without getting buy-in or without even getting any particular interest or movement on the ground. Let's move to another question, also from anon Anonymous. Uh, and I think I'll put this one to you, uh, Jose. Uh, does it take, because it's something you've touched on already, this one's from Michael Burnside, does it take an internationally popular independence movement for the multinational, multilateral system to work effectively in civil conflicts? Where uh, there's, obviously, where there's an inter uh, independence struggle involved. Yeah, I understand uh, the question. Uh, it depends also very much on the nature, the behavior of these uh, national uh, liberation independence movement. Uh, for instance, I give you an example. I spent years and years uh, in New York, at the UN, in Europe, Washington, advocating for Timor-Leste. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, 
never once I had to be confronted by critics or friends with uh, stories of how the Timorese National Liberation Movement itself committed barbarities against Indonesian civilians. That's one. So you have uh, the movement have to have the, mo the most utmost correct behavior. Never once in 24 years of our struggle, our resistance fighters ever killed a single Indonesian civilian. Many Indonesian soldiers captured, released after a few months. In 99, the most critical time when our people were being killed and our national liberation movement, Falintil, were cantoned in an area uh, and voluntarily, unilaterally cantoned, common people were urging our fighters to go out and fight. Shanana kept telling them, no, don't. Mm -hmm. So we resisted the temptation to pick up weapons at that time. So, and, uh, <clears throat> so depends. You can win the sympathy of the international community or you lose. Uh, so I always tell friends in the national movements around the world, don't descend to the level of those you are fighting and you are denouncing. Mm. Your power, your strength is your morality, your, you know, that you don't do the same. Mm. So that's one. That yes, then it won for us a lot of sympathy in Washington, in the US Congress, in the European Union, all over in Australia and so on. Uh, but let me say also uh, one at one. The international community might have responsibilities, and often it fails, sometimes it delivers. But it does not excuse us in our own countries, whether Timor-Leste or in South Sudan or wherever. Be the international community what, what it may be, hypocritical, double standards, or whatever. If we know that, well, we should be even wiser <laughs> to bridge our, uh, resolve our differences. Difference whether political or personal ambitions or ethnic or cultural or religious divisions. So that our divisions are not further exacerbated and exploited by those who have uh, their own interests. Mm. Look at Syria, God. They spend, uh, the Syrian opposition movement, uh, spend a lot of time fighting among themselves than fighting the Assad, mm. fight the Assad mm. regime mm. in South Sudan. Mm. Two people responsible for the civil war there. Yes, the UN has failed, the international community has failed, but the president and vice president of South Sudan, they bear the res moral political responsibility. And of course then people who are, uh, Sudan itself, <laughs> exploit the situation. And some other countries bordering South Sudan Congo, the huge country, you know, uh, DRC. Uh, well, uh, some neighbors profit from the conflict. Some neighbors profit. You see trucks uh, coming out of uh, DRC with uh, rare minerals, and these trucks belong to some neighboring countries. And then you have uh, powers, uh, bigger powers uh, that are not bothered. So, and. We know that, so the leaders you know, uh, in Congo are responsible. But unfortunately for Congo, ever since its independence, every leader, uh, with accept exception maybe uh, Patrice Lumumba, mm -hmm. he was not allowed to live long enough. Uh, and, uh, but since then, everyone, every leader has betrayed uh, their own people uh, in Congo. So, Responsibilities have also with us. You know, when we succeed, we should claim credit. When we fail, we should not only blame someone else. You know, let's look. Maybe we also fail here. That's why. So. Uh... All right, I'm going to put two questions together here. I think are potentially related, and I'll put this to you for me. Drawing on your own experience from what you've seen. Are there ways we can prevent conflict before it escalates? 
Uh, and there's a second question, which is about intrastate conflict. The example given is Sudan. What role does the responsibility to, pr to protect have in empowering governments to resolve uh, their own conflicts? I mean, is it those international norms? Are there other ways of, I guess, disrupting that moment? Hmm. Let, let, me, let me start with the responsibility to protect and is uh, related to the point uh, made earlier by uh, uh, President uh, Horta. I think that the principles of responsibility to protect are eminently sensible. They are elegant enough for us to make a claim uh, that that could be a basis for intervening to prevent, when I say intervening, I don't mean militarily now, to prevent the escalation of conflict. But again, we need to first repair the damage that was done following Libya. Because of Libya, and perhaps a follow on from that, as a result of that Syria, we have broken the trust that international, you know, uh, th that state You're referring actor generally, to the moment the to, to the moment of intervention and the yeah. reason for intervention uh, in Libya, and I think so. You're equally cynical about it as as Jose is. Yes, I, I think we did harm with the Libyan intervention. Mm. So, so the idea that we're we're intervening in support of a of a local society uh, that really need, needs help because that state is no longer able to protect its people, mm. even though it seemed broadly true. Mm but the, the rationale behind it and the damage that was done mm. and the double standards that we can do that in Libya but not in another place. I, I just personally, I'm interested in that yes. idea. Why, why was the rationale not correct? Uh, you know, if you could go to Libya but you couldn't go to the DRC, you, you know, if you yeah. could go to Libya, the picking and choosing of places, no sure. one went to Burundi, no one went to any of sure, these places. But I mean, so, for, for months so, on so end, it, there were people across Libya asking for this international intervention, for yes, this protection from... even some of us that watched from a distance. And this is where I think the international community as a whole, including the African Union, yeah. is to blame that you will sit and watch that at the level of the African Union and take all that time, be silent for a long time and take all the time before you decide what form of intervention and how to intervene. Of course, by the time the African Union started making its way uh, to Libya, they couldn't go there because the international consensus had already been achieved mm. at the level of UN Security Council and they were warned, uh, don't go mm. or we can't protect you. But of course, that don't go to an African Union that was funded by the European Union, even to go on that mission, I, I believe, uh, it's very sinister. So the reasons why different states did it and the, and the fact that they cannot repeat it elsewhere breaks the trust of any uh, other So it's actors. not necessarily that they shouldn't have in that instance. No, no, it's, it's not that they should They don't in others. And the reasons why they went, the stated reasons, and the other reasons. So the publicly stated reasons are different from the political reasons why they went. We can deconstruct Libya for a long time, but what I, the point I'm making is we have broken the trust of those who would have believed that this, you know, these norms are good and is a basis for action. Because whether within Africa or any other region for that matter, and in, uh, within the United Nations, we have not done right uh, by the people we claim to be pr protecting. That's why it's difficult. But what's the path to prevention, uh, to, uh, to preventing the escalation of conflict? I think you need a concerted effort, and this is where I think that the work that academics, as well as non-governmental organizations, uh, as well as meaningful state actors, because in all of this, there's some middle powers that have the right values and can speak up the collective, um, what do you call it, voice of the actors that understand what is going on and can speak up in good time, can prevent the escalation of conflict. But I regret, regretfully, I think that the, there are times we could do more and we don't and wait for the leading voices, be it in the form of the leading voices uh, in the uh, UN Security Council or the leading voices in terms of regional institutions. We wait for them to act first. And even our research then begins to draw uh, from those experiences. And I thought it was evidence I was supposed to drive uh, those policies and decisions. But sometimes policies and those decisions guide uh, 
evidence uh, development. And there's something skilled about how we have collectively uh, dealt with uh, the subject of peace and stability. We're very emotional about it, rightly so, but I think that we have more power than we care to admit. We just need to articulate uh, a different way of doing it and test it. So far, no one has put any alternative on the table as the thing that should replace the kind of uh, uh, broken nature of the international system because we've had far more failures than successes of late. And that needs to change. Fix the system we've got. Can it be done? Can, can we fix the international system? Can we make it work? Can we solve all of these conflicts and semi-conflicts -confl that are uh, unfolding yeah. everywhere? Yeah, let me say a bit about uh, some of the positive and the indispensable parts of the UN system. For instance, South, again, back to South Sudan. And I t share with you the story of a three-year-old girl. When uh, we did a report, the high-level panel on UN peace operations, I dedicated our report to a three-year-old girl. Her, from South, her name is Nyakahak. That girl, three years old, she walked four hours across the war zone from her village guiding her blind father with a stick towards a UNICEF feeding center. This story, and that's how I wrote in the dedication to her, tell two, two stories. One, the failure of the international community in preventing the conflict in South Sudan, but also it tells of the indispensability of the UN in spite of the failure, the shortcomings, Nyakaha wouldn't be alive. Many tens of thousands more would have died if it were not for the presence of the UN on the ground. Mm -hmm. So it cannot automatically prevent or resolve every conflict, but it has saved thousands of lives in spite of the fact that member states are among the first to emasculate the UN system. You know, like look at the, the current U.S. administration, uh, cutting of money to the U.N. agencies working in uh, Gaza, West Bank. Uh, U.N., a, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, Secretary General Antonio Guterres had a press conference in New York where he said, never before in the U.N. history, by mid-year, June, the U.N. had run out of money for its core costs. $200 million. Partly, I think two-thirds of member states were not paying their bills. And that's not even including the budget for peacekeeping operations. Does not include budget for UN agencies. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's all our effort. But at the same time, let's wait. On the issue of prevention and uh, uh, the responsibility to protect, these two concepts, prevention and responsibility, supposed to be simple, no? supposed to be consensual. Who can agree with prevention? But let me tell you, <laughs> the word prevention created its own problems in the UN, in the UN <laughs> General Assembly. Because some countries, in the discussion when we presented, I presented the report, said, we hope that prevention is not going to be a door, a window for interference <laughs> in domestic affairs. And then, but responsibility to protect lost credibility, well, because of the way the responsibility to protect was misused by three powers, the US, France, and the UK in the case of Libya. It immediately ring alarm bell when you talk about the res responsibility to protect. Does it mean regime change? Mm -hmm. Overthrow the regime? Protect who? So, uh, so even uh, issues that you know, seem to be consensual, then who wouldn't agree with prevention? Mm -hmm. <laughs> create create these, uh, mm -hmm. these problems. Well, unbelievably, we've raced well through the hour mark. Um, it's been captivating and 
frankly pretty inspiring to listen to you both. So would you please all put your hands together for <laughs> Professor Finley Olamishaki and His Excellency Professor Joseph Ramos Walker. Thank you.